Uh, Nate uh, has uh, been involved in Linux for quite a while. He used to write for LWN. Um, he's also been studying fonts for quite a long time. Um, and he's going to talk to us about how he wishes fonts worked uh, in GNOME specifically. So over to you, Nate. Thanks. Uh, as always, uh, I always throw my presentations together at the last possible second. This is a bit more last second than the normal because of the whole voting on the day of thing. Um, so yeah, like, like has just been suggested, I'm a recent college graduate. Uh, I spent about a year and a half hanging out with designers, graphic designers, and book designers, and information designers. And I would like them to feel comfortable in desktop Linux. So I, I studied what they do when they're working with fonts on their other OSs. Although I really would like, you know, to see us meet the needs of other people who rely on fonts to get their work done too, like translators, linguists, printers, and publishers. I also want to shout out to Bastian for maybe giving me unintentionally the idea for this talk. He gave a Gladek talk a couple years ago where he was describing how he wanted something to work, although he didn't tell us it was all a lie until the end. But I'm going to be upfront about that because I haven't planned it very far. So yeah, this is going to be like, what would be the ideal way for for font packages to work for people who need to use them in a, uh, in a project of theirs. So uh, really this comes down to one of the big dichotomies in fonts, uh, which there's actually two that are probably worth noting. The first one is that, that font packages are both software and content, which is to say they have executable code in them that gets interpreted um, for important reasons like rasterizing and stuff like that. And they're also a content element, which means that it's something that the user has to make a decision about and it goes into the document or the thing that they're working on. And uh, currently, um, as my unnamed source points out, our packages do a really good job of filling that software role, but they're just basically treated like a software element and we don't have the pieces in place that let people work with it like they do other content objects. Uh, the other dichotomy is that no matter what you do, we can fix everything in the software center and the way we distribute fonts that way, but people are always gonna be getting stuff in zip files they download from their browser. And if we don't think about that too, then uh, we're probably missing some pieces. So let's enter the fantasy land. Um, it starts with somebody working on documents. Uh, because they're working on documents, they have to select a font. And the fact that this is a document they're working on imposes constraints on them uh, and, and requirements. Because it's a specific document, for example, what if it's the GNOME Foundation Annual Report? There's things that change depending on what the document is. So we might have decided, okay, this year, we, it has to be in English, because we're printing it in English. Uh, we also have several uh, names and, and places that are in Spanish and German that we wanna make sure look correct. And also, for some other reason, we've decided that we want to print it all in English and in Persian as well. And it needs to look right uh, in both of those. Also, we're giving this to people who really care about annual reports, so it needs to look right. We can't do it all in a handwriting font. We can't do it in like a stencil looking font, something like that, and it's gotta have good captions and, and stuff like that. So those are sort of our constraints as we make the choice. Okay, starting off, we'll just check the font manager, pretend that exists, you give me a feel. Okay, uh, so we need to see if we have something that's designed that covers all those languages. Uh, yeah, there's four of them. It turns out when we look around, we do have several things that cover both Latin and Arabic, but some of those aren't gonna handle the Spanish or the German rights, and maybe some of the Arabic ones aren't gonna be the right style uh, to set Persian text. Okay, so that cuts out some of our potential choices there. We move on. Uh, we also know because this is a big document, we're gonna have to do some uh, regular text and some italics, and we wanna have those captions, which needs to be an optical size thing, and some headlines, which is gonna look different too. Uh, and when we add those constraints in, we have lost even more things because a lot of those fonts we found that handled the languages we wanted uh, just have a single style. Well, that's okay. Um, we can move on, we need to search for the features that make our text look good, so we can look for, in the font manager, which of these fonts has small caps, which of them has tabular numbers, so that we can set our budget lines and they all line up correctly, and uh, which of them have uh, old style numbers so that we can set things in the text and they look okay. Well, maybe that narrows us down to like two, uh, and maybe one of those we're not totally happy with for some design reason, the other one we like a lot, but it doesn't have those numeral features. But we do have a little more information by having narrowed it down to this choice. So like, well, maybe we could modify that 
plot that doesn't have the numerals and put the numerals in a different different plot. It's a table. No one's going to know. Um, because we have some, some information, we know who designed that font. We can just search, okay, did they do anything else? They seem to do a good job of, of making this complex font family. Uh, so we trust them and we just search for their name in the font manager. And uh, unfortunately, there's nothing else there. So we don't want to have to choose four different fonts to set this text and have to adjust the line spacing and everything else just to make it all look good together. So let's go to the, the software center and find a font that's not installed in our system and maybe that meets our needs. I'm not gonna redo all that made up searching that we did, but you have the same issue, which is that in the font manager, you're seeing what's installed already in the software center, you're seeing what's available to you, but you still have the same constraints, so you still wanna search the same way. Maybe we find something there, but uh, hypothetically, we see some things and we don't get all the information we want, but we can look up where those fonts come from because we can see that there's a home page link, there's a specimen there that it shows what it looks like. So that's a little more information still. Um, maybe we don't actually find what we want though. So our last resort is we just go to Google and we look around on the web and we eventually find a font that we, that we like. Uh, so what happens then? Well, we, we download it, it comes in a zip file and you open a zip file in your browser file roller on a GNOME based desktop, we'll open it up. And uh, what happens when we open it up? Well, we double click on the TTF or the OTF and then GNOME Font Viewer pops up, offers to install it for us if we want to do that. We say yes, because we know it's what we want, we're going to use it. And then a system utility looks at the font and makes a record of all that metadata that we were searching on earlier. Who was the designer? Does it have these features? What was the design language? And it stores that somewhere, so that when we open up the font manager next time, it's already there for us. We don't have to go in and manually add all that stuff. Uh, and then the installer also notices that the zip file contained this booklet that's showing the font in use and it contains a, a PDF that explains what all the features do. And so it says, do you want to install that in the help and documentation section on your desktop? And we say yes, because that's what we'd like to have available to us the next time we're making the choice. Well, obviously that's not what actually happens right now. So let's briefly look at what does happen. Um, the closest thing there is to a, a font manager for a GTK desktop now is this third party tool called GTK Font Manager. If the author of this is here, I'd like to talk to you, but uh, it shows some stuff in the uh, metadata general category there. It's got a postscript name and weight and slants and spacing uh, parameters. Those are things that come out of tables in the font, so it's clearly just got access to metadata such as it is defined already in the font format. You can see a little waterfall text. Uh, you'll notice that that's, that's Latin. Um, it may not even show us what we want to see. This is an index script called Bengali and a character table is useless here because this is a writing system where the characters have to connect and they combine together and you can't tell if it works or not by seeing them in individual cells. You have to see it if the word forms are shaped correctly. Uh, and you know, a real specimen would let you see that, whereas this doesn't really. Uh, also, about those features, currently the way you, you can tell, or the easiest way you can tell whether or not your font has the features you need technically is to open it up in something like Scribus that has added support, Inkscape as well. Um, possibly a couple other, I think, LibreOffice can make use of font features, but I don't know if six, if LibreOffice 6 actually has a way to investigate them. I'll check on that. But you have to open it up in an application to see whether or not you have features available to you. Uh, the software center story, it's, it's all right. I mean, you can do a little bit of searching on the description field, which is something that's written usually by the package manager. And a lot of times that will tell you something about the language it's designed for. Um, again, the samples are gonna be pretty minimal. They're probably gonna be automatically generated. So there's not a lot of information there that we wanted. And they may just fail entirely for one reason or another. Um, so that's tofu. Uh, and the same is true of, unfortunately, the, the font manager, you don't always end up with the ability to automatically detect the, the metadata that you want. I suppose this slide is actually supposed to have been a few earlier, but bear with me on that. 
Um, and yeah, the big thing that I've been thinking about recently is this uh, this zip download problem because this is what people do half the time, maybe. And when you open up a zip file that contains fonts, uh, you're you're lucky if you get anything other than just single TTFs installed. Um, there is actually an appropriate place to, on a user session install documentation under dot local share. Uh, we just don't handle that right now. Um, I also want to show a couple slides of what the specimen things I keep mentioning are. These are things that are designed often like marketing material and commercial font foundries make these uh, to give away to people to, to buy the font. But it'll show you the font in a document setting as opposed to just a single line that may not even be a full sentence. And it'll show you, this is Bengali again, whether or not the uh, letters are shaped correctly into their right orthographic form. Uh, and generally they're just, they're more of a design object than a automatically created object and so you get more of a uh, real world use case out of them. And in some cases, this is the multi-layer color font bungee. You would not figure out how to combine all the layers of bungee if you didn't have examples. Uh, some of this is also real technical, like how you access features and what they do might not be obvious, it's like small caps is pretty well understood but the open type feature set includes a lot of things that what it means varies up based on what the designer has chosen. So alternates uh, for certain characters, maybe it's a one story G instead of a two story G, but maybe it's something that's specific to a certain language. And just knowing that it has the feature doesn't tell you that. So something that indicates why this feature exists is usually helpful, um, particularly if you've got the ability to search that Here's an example of this. This is from E.B. Garamond, I think. So he's just explaining what the figures are. These are historical, uh, there's contextual literature for certain combinations. I think those are chosen because of, uh, you know, they existed in the original font. But I, again, if you don't know why it exists, just knowing the features there is a little less useful. Uh, and then this uh, just sort of demonstrates um, those options. Okay, so yeah, this is what we're facing currently is the zip file and what to do with it. Um, I think the potential exists to maybe treat a downloaded font a lot nicer like you do with music, uh, which is probably the simplest example of another content object that people download off the internet. Whereas our, our music players, whichever one you use, uh, they're well versed in um, handling content from outside the package manager, outside the software center. And they do it with Tracker. Tracker extracts and indexes the metadata in MP3s. And so it's stored no matter which, uh, well, I guess whichever Tracker compliant music player you use, we'll, we'll find that. Uh, the other thing worth noting is that uh, we have utilities like EasyTag to edit those metadata fields. Um, historically, it's been frowned upon to directly edit the metadata in a font that you've downloaded from the internet, possibly because people just think you might change it to look like you own it or do something nefarious like that. It's a little bit less of an issue with, with open source fonts. But uh, again, if we were keeping the metadata in some separate place, that wouldn't be an issue. You can correct mistakes, you can fill in something that's missing, you can add your own tags. Uh, if we support that. Um, so I want to end on progress note. Matthias has done a ton of work uh, on the upcoming GTK stable release on the Font Explorer to let you see things. And the nice, uh, as I've indicated, there's some applications that have access to font features and some metadata like that too. But the nice thing about doing that in GTK is that it's available to any application. Um, I think in the past we've sort of thought design applications care about this non-design applications don't. I don't feel like that's true. I think the people who work on translation and internationalization care about a lot of these same things, and other people as well. Um, AppStream and SPDX are where we would extend what's visible in the software center, and I've proposed a few things there that might come together in a release cycle or two, and I'm trying to sell some of this idea to 
font package maintainers. Uh, the big one that's new for me is, is Tracker because I just haven't dealt with Tracker before, but I, I had a hallway chat yesterday and there's a BOP coming up, so there may be progress or the potential to let Tracker index important things from your font collection too. Um, that is all I have. I'd be happy to answer your questions on any of this. If you want. Another type of application that is in the um, uh, sort of dedicated font uh, software stores at the moment. So there's an application that was recently added to FlatHub, which is where I found it, called uh, Font Finder, which basically is a front end onto Google Fonts um, and has a little bit more, like it's very uh, feature light, you might say, but has some interesting stuff around like your own um, order uh, discovery of fonts around things like popularity uh, some some more stuff around type which is kind of interesting and some of your own um, text which you can very easily look at the different weights and stuff in there which is kind of kind of handy and kind of nice um, right. and has a very easy and simple install button which is a key yeah. uh, a key part so I you know check it out and uh, add that to your list of people to bug uh, yeah I, I left that one out I intentionally because it's kind of a it's kind of a third way to get fonts on your system um, there's a couple of third-party proprietary font managers that exist too, font base mm -hmm. and something else. Um, so yeah, and, and the thing about the, the Google font specific one is that it's tied into that library service. And I feel like potentially in the future we're gonna see a third way to get fonts on to the system being synchronizing with some online account that you have like that or Adobe has a commercial one called Typekit. They might decide to release it for Linux, they certainly could. Um, which is always the fourth way of getting a font on the system, which is making it locally, but most people don't, don't bother with that. But one in the back, waiting behind the column. As someone who usually just accepts the defaults and prays that it works, <laughs> um, are there standards for how capabilities that a font provides are exposed to the user or is it just every application is free to, to do it on their own or do you mean in the UI standards? yeah yeah uh, there's not and um, the, the really fun thing is that that's also true on Mac OS and Windows and it bugs people who do this for a living so the the uh, graphic designers are really irked by the fact that the way you access those things in InDesign is totally different than Illustrator. Um, so a few years ago at Libra Graphics meeting, which is all the open source graphics apps, we had a, a breakout session one day about uh, feature UIs and implementation. And it's just, it's slow enough implementing those things for these individual projects that they haven't really all converged to the same place, but I think they're interested in maintaining compatibility with each other. So that's a positive sign. Um, I, the big one at the moment, without anything to offer is GIMP. Uh, since GIMP is about to start porting to a whole new toolkit release, they may have other things on their plate. Um, but yeah, I think the, the Scribus and the Inkscape people are sort of casually interested in making sure they take the same approach to things. So if that works out, that would actually leapfrog what Adobe has managed to do internally with their own tools, so that'd be good. Do, do, do we, I mean, I feel like it'd be good to have more, like some kind of free font, I don't know what there is, but some kind of free font place where Collaborate more on fonts, or even just tracking updates of fonts, or all, all these kind of things. I don't know. Do you mean on, on creating or on using fonts? Uh, Do you mean on creating fonts or on, on no, how you're using the, them? And more on the creative side, I guess. Yeah. yeah um, I guess at the moment, there's so few people who work only on 
open source fonts that they just sort of hang out in the regular type design places and just recognize each other. Uh, but I mean, there, there's more, there's a lot of commercial foundries who want things published on Google fonts now because it's so visible, so they've released open source fonts even if they were vehemently opposed to the concept five years ago. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's a little bit of a bigger pool than it used to be. But yeah, there's always mailing lists and so on. In that case, thank you very much, Nate, for your talk.